So hello, uh, my name's Ron, and um, I wanted to talk about uh, how, if you're used to working in an OOP space, you know, you're used to thinking in terms of design patterns, you know, I think most of us have a copy of the Giga 4 book on our shelf, whether we've read it or not, uh, and we refer and talk to them a lot, um, you know, in interviews, if not always in our code, and, uh, but we're, you know, at least familiar uh, with uh, using them and, and talking about them in, uh, in our programs. And so uh, I wanted to do a talk about how that, uh, those design patterns that we're familiar with, sometimes more, sometimes less, translate when ported over to the functional, uh, functional world, specifically closure, since that my, that's my, uh, my, currently my favorite uh, programming language is the one I work in every day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was hard for me to put this talk together, actually, because I've been using closure now uh, like full time for nearly two years. And I found when I opened up my uh, Gang of Four book, started flipping through looking at the design patterns for examples, uh, I, uh, it, it was very hard for me to understand that, that they were problems that needed to be solved. And uh, let, me, let me share a quote with you that sort of expresses what I've, what I've got here. Uh, this is from Alan uh, Perlis, who you may remember is you know, one of the founders of the uh, Algo language and actually the first winner of the Turing Award. Um, he did an article, which is awesome, you guys should all read if you haven't, uh, for ACM back in 1982. Uh, called Epigrams on Programming, were just little one-sentence nuggets, you know, distilling his wisdom, accumulated over decades working in programming. And this is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, it's, it's better to have 100 functions operating on one data structure than to have 10 functions operate on 10 data structures. And I, I, I really didn't understand this until after using Clojure for so long, because in Clojure, like, our, our basic types are really maps and vectors. Like, that's what I deal in every day. That's, my functions that I write are mostly taking in maps and vectors, or maybe uh, lists of maps, and doing operations on them and returning the same things. So I'm writing you know, hundreds, thousands of functions, all operating on one or two data structures. And so a lot of the patterns that uh, you need to deal with the problem of having multiple data structures, or these multiple objects, um, like you know, writing an iterator uh, for a set of objects that doesn't normally have it. Well, I don't have to do that. It's built into all the stuff I use. Uh, the visitor pattern of being able to, you know, do an operation for each one of, the, of a set of objects, you know, and, and have it, you know, work with several. Well, I, I don't care. I just write map over my vector and I'm done. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things I just I just don't deal with at all uh, every day in, in closure. Um, but there are a few that I want to talk about. A little uh, spoiler there. Uh, three that I want to talk about specifically where um, you, you might need them uh, still in a functional namespace, uh, functional uh, language, uh, and to show what they might look like. So specifically I want to talk about strategy, uh, adapter, and the template me method uh, patterns. So strategy pattern. So uh, the gist of this pattern, uh, for those of you who have forgotten uh, or never learned it, that's fine. Um, <coughs> is when you, you basically you want, you have multiple methods of calculating uh, something or doing an operation, and you might want to change them out on the fly. So you're gonna write uh, several classes probably to the same interface so that whatever is calling them can just swap one out for another and not notice or care. So in a functional language, this is what something like that might look like. And, uh, if you're not familiar with reading closure code, it's usually best to stop, start at the bottom, actually work your way up, um, because we have to declare things first and, and all that stuff. So uh, here at the bottom, we have a def in. We're defining a new function, uh, shave yak. So we're going to shave a yak. This is what we're going to do. Uh, and as you can imagine, there might be multiple ways of shaving a yak. Uh, we might have one to switch them out. So we have a yak. Uh, so the, the next the little vector there is, is defining the inputs to this function. So we're going to take a yak, uh, some time, and some twits and then we're gonna shave the yak. So the, right below that, what we have is choose shave technique time to it. So in case you're not used to reading parentheses, uh, what this is doing is calling choose shave technique time to it. So that's, that's a function, right, that I'm calling with those inputs, and that's gonna return me a function that I'm gonna call on the yak to get the shaving done, okay? Uh, so all right, so we need to look up one more. Um, def n choose shave technique. Okay, so we're gonna choose that shave technique. We're taking time into it. Uh, so how are we gonna make our decision? We're going to use a structure called a cond, which is basically like a, a big case statement uh, enclosure. So each uh, of the things in the initial parentheses, like the equal zero time to it, 
That's like an if check. So if this thing is true, do the thing that, that follows. Um, and I've got three laid out here. Uh, the first one, if you have no time and no to its, then return blunt force. So the function that we're going to end up calling on this uh, shape yak is blunt force. No one's laughing at the pun. That's fine. Uh, okay, so if we, and then the next, okay, what if that's not true? All right, we're gonna fall on to the next one. So if we have enough time, so the next check is an and on those two uh, predicate checks, enough time to its, enough time, time, enough to its, to its, uh, then we're gonna hammock first, uh, which is the best way to program, I think. <clears throat> so you don't make mistakes later, later on. So we're gonna return that function. Uh, so the else is that, uh, that catch-all uh, for our con statement here. Um, so if we, we have you know, more than zero time, but not really enough. And we have more than zero too, it's not really enough. We're just gonna take a little off the top. And then at the top there, uh, the three of the def ends just sketched out, you know, blunt force, hammock first, just a little off the top. That, they all just take a yak. So this is a function that's you know, doing the work of actually shaving the yak, but it's you know, letting this choose the strategy, so to speak. And you could, I mean, you could use anything to switch out your strategy, right? You could have config values or anything else uh, to do that. But, it's just an example of uh, what it would look like here. So you notice, I mean, to me, this is a lot simpler than the implementation I saw in, in Gang of Four in terms of objects and, uh, you know, you have to have a class hierarchy and maybe you have to define an interface or a couple of interfaces and other objects keep track of that. Mm, yeah. No, it's all functions. I'm just going to call functions. And, you know, I don't even, th this actually is kind of my favorite part here because it's, it's, it's saying, I'm you know, I'm calling a function that gives me a function that I call the function on here. Like, and there's, such a simple way to express that, I love it. Any questions about that before I move on? I mean, we're all familiar with shaving yak, so I think that's pretty, it's pretty clear. Okay, good. Okay, so adaptive pattern, next. Uh, so this is uh, where, this comes into play uh, really bad if you are pulling in a third party library and you've got a set of objects or an interface that, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a, you know, a square peg and you've got a round hole, basically. You need to adapt the lib or the objects, whatever that you're using, uh, to what you, what you are expecting on another end. Maybe you've got some intermediate piece of code that you need to write to get between the two. Um, and again, in, a, in an OOP space, this is a fairly uh, frequent problem, right, where you're gonna have, uh, like I said, third-party libraries uh, aren't written to your specs, they're written to theirs. So you have to you know, write some, some glue code to stitch them together, maybe a couple of extra objects. Again, you're gonna get into class hierarchies and all that stuff. Well, uh, in enclosure, it's a lot simpler. So we're using protocols here. Uh, and protocols are something that we use when we actually have to touch objects in closure, um, which I don't recommend. But when you have to do it, um, so uh, we use a protocol. And protocol is basically, it's like an interface. It's the equivalent uh, to an interface in closure. So at the top there, and the reason the user uh, hyphen there is because I actually wrote this on a REPL, so you can go to a REPL right now and check this if you don't believe me. Um, you know, please don't believe me, please check it. Uh, so we have def protocol barking dog. So we're defining a new protocol, we're calling it barking dog. Um, uh, this is a barking dog. That's just a doc string that's part of the definition of the protocol. And then we're saying, okay, so this protocol, this interface, anything that implements this interface needs to define a method, uh, bark, that takes the thing uh, and does something. You notice it's not even sketched out what'll happen here because this is just the, the protocol definition, uh, the interface. And again, I've got a little doc, doc string there. The dog should bark, whatever it is. Okay, so now we got our, our protocol. Now what can we do with it? Well, it turns out we can alter uh, a fundamental building block of the closure language, the vector. Now, I mentioned that vectors is one of those fundamental data structures that we use every day. Well, I can make them bark. So I can use extend protocol uh, barking dog. So I'm gonna extend a protocol, which protocol? Barking dog, that's what I'm gonna extend. Uh, and I'm gonna extend it, extend it on this uh, class, closure.leg.ipersistent vector. I had to look that up, don't worry about it. Uh, and then I give the function definition there. So if you call bark on a persistent vector, uh, you get the thing V, that's just the argument. And um, since it's a vector, I can call conj on it, and I'm gonna conj the string bark on it. And that's what I'm gonna do. And so the nil there is just the, uh, the REPL acknowledging, okay, I, I got it, um, but what you gave me didn't really do anything, so I didn't operate on anything, so you just get a nil back, that's fine. All right, so let's define a new vector. So uh, def of vector, uh, and it's just uh, a list of integers there, one, two, three, four, 
and the REPL gives back uh, the hash uh, quote there saying, okay, in the user namespace, you've defined a new thing called a vector, great. Uh, and now let's call bark on it. So we call bark on a vector, and then we get that same uh, list of integers, but now look, it called the uh, our bark method that we defined and conj the string bark onto the end of it, so now it's bark. So uh, just with those few lines, I've completely changed in this way, you know, extended the behavior of a fundamental class here. So if you can imagine, if I can do that to this fundamental piece of the closure language, I can do it to any third party uh, lib object that I get or any other class I get in. I can make it do exactly what I want. I don't have to mess around with an adapter class. I don't have to write a new thing. I can say, I want it to do this, make it do that, that's how it's gonna do it, and then it does it. Very powerful. Any questions about barking? Okay. Template method. Okay, so uh, this is something you'll use when uh, maybe uh, a class that's doing an operation, maybe something that's part of that strategy hierarchy of objects you wrote earlier, yuck, uh, needs to, um, I've forgotten the word, offset? It, want, it basically wants to uh, leave off some of the calculations to some other subclass that maybe you might input to it or maybe it finds on its own, maybe it's defined in a parent class somewhere over here that you have to go to the higher, yeah, whatever. Uh, but basically, like the part of the, the uh, calculation that you're doing is being uh, handled by some other subclass instead of the class itself. So in Clojure, um, it, again, it's it's much much easier. Um, we basically uh, use a higher order function. So since in Clojure, like we saw in the strategy pattern, where we were uh, calling a function that gave us a function, right? We can write functions that take functions as arguments, and then they call those functions and things get done. So in this case, uh, you actually have to ignore my bottom to top and actually go top to bottom. Uh, so we start with uh, defining up to get account status. So we're writing uh, either a, a server side app or maybe it's a web app, we're updating the uh, status of an account, status of a user. Um, and that function is gonna take uh, four, uh, four parameters. It's gonna take an account ID, a get fun, a get function, uh, a status that we're updating it to, and then the, uh, the save function that we wanna call. Uh, so the first thing we do is do a let binding, uh, and that's just uh, an easy way to define um, a var a var inside uh, a function, so it's available there. Um, it's just for readability. Um, and so what we do is we define Account, so we're gonna say account inside the rest of the body of this function, it is going to be whatever we get when we call the get fun on that account ID. So we got a function from somebody else, we don't know what it was, we don't care. We're just gonna call it. Um, we're gonna give it an account ID and we're gonna expect something back. Whatever it gives us, that's the account, that's what we're gonna work with. Okay, it's probably, it's probably gonna give us a map, right, because this is closure. We're probably sending in an integer or maybe a UUID if we're fancy. Uh, for the account ID and then getting a map back. Um, okay, so then we got the account, so that we do a, a when check, so when, uh, that says when not equal status, status account. So again, uh, I'm, I'm assuming in this case that the account coming back is a map, and so the status keyword there by, I can actually, in Clojure I can use the keyword as a function to call it on the map and it gives me the value. So what this is saying is, uh, take the status, uh, the current status of the account, give me that out of that map that I got back from the get fun, and check to see if it's equal to the status that was passed into this function. So presumably the new status that someone wants to update it to, we wanna see if those two things are equal. If they're not equal, if the new status is different, that's the only time you wanna do anything, um, but this function isn't responsible for knowing how to do that, it got passed into save fun, so it's gonna call that save function uh, after associating that new status onto the account. So the associate there is to say, uh, take the account map and um, as associate with it uh, a new value, this status, with the keyword status. So basically, what this will do is give you a new map that overrides that old status value with the new status, and then sends that into the save fun. And then, you know, later on, we can define, so with this uh, function written, we can define as many, you know, get and save funds as we want. We can get a, define a get one that gets it from a database or gets it from Datomic. Please don't. Uh, gets it from some HTTP service. Maybe it's, you know, uh, getting it, calling a REST API to get it, and we can do the same thing with the save. And this function update account status doesn't ever have to know or care 
where it's getting its data or where it's going to or how it's doing it. All it cares about is if I call the get fun on account ID, do I get a map? And if I call the save fun, does it do what I want it to do? That's it. All right, and that's, that's all I have. Are there any other, any other questions? This was a really quick talk. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank <laughs> you.